it's my pleasure today to invite Daryl Leith to the channel. Um, it's 45 years, but uh, I actually served with Daryl, or he, he was at least in the platoon that I served in, which was two RR mortars. And um, he also served in five in depth um, as um, <clears throat> also as a medic, as well as in mortars. And so he's got some interesting tales for us. Um, Daryl, it's good to have you back on the scene. Yeah, and uh, 45 years later, the old uh, gray cells are a little bit uh, a little bit buggered, but we'll do what we can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good to see you again. So can yeah. you can you tell us where you went to school and um, how you eventually got into the army? Okay, Danny, well, the reason why I'm doing this chat is because uh, in three days' time, it'll be the 46th anniversary of the Kazakh and the Bezo Connor Jones. So let me pick it up from there. Okay, I was born in Bulawayo on the 6th of October 1955 at the Lady Rodwell Hospital. Uh, I started my schooling in January 1961 at um, Jesse Lovemore Kindergarten in Bulawayo, South Town. And 12 years and 10 months later, my schooling came to an end on a Thursday morning, I think it was. I wrote my last O level. And uh, 35 minutes or 30 minutes after the O level had finished, I walked out of the school as a scholar. And as I got out of the main gate, I became an unemployed job seeker. So, yeah. So, <clears throat> so the interesting thing here was it, it had been my life's ambition to join the police. And four days after I'd finished school, on a Monday morning, I caught a bus from Southwold where we lived, the, the Bellevue bus from Southwold to the city hall. And from the city hall, I went across to the uh, main police uh, charge office in Bulawayo. And uh, I went to the charge office main and I said, listen, I'm here. I want to join the police. And I was taken through the charge office, through the background, to the recruiting officer's office. And I told the recruiting officer that I'm there. I'd like to join the police. I'd been many, many years that I'd wanted to join the police. Anyway, so the, the long and short of it was, I was told I had to do an aptitude test, which would consist of a math exam and then a spelling test. And when the recruiting officer said a math exam, straight away my initial was, uh, okay, well, we're going to give this one the miss, or maybe the place is not quite for me. Because up until then, I'd never ever passed a math exam in my life. So as soon as he said math exam, I thought, that's it, I'm out of this, this equation altogether. Anyway, so I did the math exam, and to my utter surprise, it was beyond easier than easier, and I passed it with 100%. But when I came to do the spelling test, I was very, I was quite confident in the spelling test because I did well in English at school. So anyway, I got 17 out of 20 and the requirement was 18 out of 20. And to this day, I can still remember the three spellings I got wrong, which was pneumatic, torpolin, and pneumonia. So I was told, go home, come back in two or three days' time, learn how to spell those spellings, and come back again and we'll do this test again. So that's what I did. I went home, I learned the three words, went back to the charge office, two days later, three days later, and redid the test, and I passed it this time. And then the recruiting officer said, listen, unfortunately, had you come 10 days or two weeks earlier, you could have got you into the next intake going in, which was going in in a week or two's time. But unfortunately, you missed out on that one. So what we're going to do is in January, the first intake going in in January, you can join that one. So I was quite well with that. So I thanked him for everything, and I left the charge office, and I went across to Gordon's where my mom worked. And I told her, listen, I've just been to the police station, I've written, the I've written the exams, and I passed both of them, and I'm going to join the police. And having known for many, many years that I wanted to be a policeman, she was obviously very pleased about that. And uh, she congratulated me, and then she phoned my grand and told my grandmother. And with that, I went home, and I waited for my dad to arrive. And um, I was hoping that my dad was going to be quite pleased with my situation. And when dad eventually did arrive, and from the railways, um, I told him uh, that I'd been to the police station in the morning, I'd done the aptitude test, I'd passed them, and I was told that I could come back in January and join the intake then. And I was expecting my dad to say, well done, Daz, you've finally done, you know, you've done really well, and I'm really, really pleased with you. But unfortunately, it never ended up that way. The first question my dad asked me was, did you sign any paperwork? And I said, no. I was told to come back in uh, between Christmas and the new year, and uh, if I still wanted to join the police, and then I'll be signed up and I could go to January intake. And then my dad dropped the bombshell. He said, listen, my son, um, I am presently organizing you an apprenticeship on the railways as, a, as an apprentice fitter, and you'll be starting in January. And that was the furthest thing from my mind. I was not mechanically orientated. I had no interest whatsoever in anything mechanical. It just wasn't part of my 
that just this way I wasn't I wasn't anyway so my dad won the day and I started an apprenticeship but the, the app is winning on a, in a January I only started in March because I tried anything and everything humanly possible to get out of becoming an apprentice which didn't work so anyway as I say I started my apprenticeship and which I actually quite enjoy to be honest with you and during my second year as an apprentice two of the appies that I was serving with Dave Premantle and Lionel Cooper were both called up for one for seven and I was quite confident that because I worked with him and we were second year apprentices that my call up was going to come as well very soon anyway probably three weeks to a month later I still hadn't heard anything from the army I hadn't been called up nothing had come so I decided I was going to take an unofficial Friday afternoon off of work and head down to Brady Barracks and go and find out, hey, what's going on here? Why haven't I been called up for one for seven as well? So that's what I did, Tony. Uh, on a Friday afternoon, uh, come lunchtime, I went to my cupboard, took my overalls off, put my clothes on, and I said to my fellow happy, goodbye, I'll see you on Monday. And off I went. And I went down to Brady Barracks. I parked in the public car park and walked down to the MP or the RP that was on the main gate. And I said, listen, I want to join the army. Uh, who am I required to go and see? And basically, he turned around and he pointed. And he said, you see that building over there? And I said, yep. And he said, okay, that's where you're going to be going to. And that building happened to be one mid company. So off I went down to one mid company. I got to the reception there and there was a sergeant on the desk. And I said, uh, I'm here. I would like to volunteer to go into intake 147 because two of the apprentices that I work with at work we're going into the same intake as well, and I would like to go into an intake where I know the people around me, or to at least two of the chaps. And he said to me, okay, just hang on a bit. Uh, he'll go and find out. And off he went. And a few minutes later, he came back again and he said to me, okay, please follow me. And I followed him through the reception area, and we went to the back. And probably 20 minutes, 25 minutes later, my medical was over. And he took me to a side office, and he said, just hold on here for a few minutes. Somebody will be with you soon. So I sat for a few minutes and then uh, a captain came through who was obviously the commanding officer of uh, one bit company at the time. And I recognized him as one of the Bulawayo local doctors, but I had no clue what his name was, but I just recognized the face. And he said to me, he had been through my results and my results seemed quite fine. And what he was going to do on Monday morning, he would send them off to wherever he was going to send them to, to be processed. And then he said to me, to be very, very honest with you, I doubt that you're going to make a 147 call up. Uh, you'll probably go 148 or 149. And that was something I didn't want to hear. Uh, I had made up my mind I was going to 147, and that was the only intake. Anyway, I said, thanks very much, and I left. I went back to the railways as as, 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 as per the normal. And again, probably two weeks, three weeks later, still no call ups had come, and I decided I was going to take a second unofficial off on a Friday afternoon and go back to Brady to find out what the hell was going on, why haven't I been called up yet. And during that time, um, I arrived home from work one afternoon and there's a register slip, register slip at the house waiting for me. So I went off down to the Hillside Post Office, got my co- got my slip and it was my collapse. And I was a bit hesitant to open the, the actual collapse because I was dreading a 148. I was really, really dreading this 148. <laughs> anyway, after two or three hours, I built up the courage once I was home and I opened the uh, collapse thinking this is going to be a 148 or a 149. And to my utter surprise, it was a 147 collapse. So on the 17th, on Thursday, the 17th of January, 1975, with a double intake call-up, I stood outside the uh, the main um, guard, guard room at, at Llewellyn with probably about 250 other chaps. I don't know how many were there, but we were we were the first double intake to be called up ever. And we'd been there for a while, and three instructors arrived. Who they were, I have no idea to this day. I think on my first day, I didn't really take much in. I was just so damn nervous of being <laughs> at Brady at the time. Yeah. You know, this is fairly large. I remember he was a fairly large, well-built instructor. And I think he was probably our two platoon instructor, Bill Hurley. Anyway, he called out. He said, listen up, you guys. When I call your names, I want you to respond. And wherever I point, that's where you're going to go and stand. So off he went. He, started, he must have called up about 20 names and pointed at, at a certain direction. And on and on, and it went on and on and on. And eventually it came to Leith, DW. And I responded, yes, sir. And he didn't really point to anywhere. He was, he was quiet and I could see him looking around. And for a second time, he went, Leith, DW. And again, I responded, yes, sir. And he looked around and, and our eyes met. And he sort of looked at me and I was looking at him, but he still hadn't pointed anyway. So I stood where I was. And for the third time, he said, Leith, DW. And this time I put my hand up and I said, yes, sir. 
and you just offer those steps in a flash. I'll tell you what, and you stood literally millimeters away from me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do I look like an effing yes, sir, to you? And that was my introduction to uh, my national service. I, I had that as well. Yeah. When the yeah, corporal yeah. said, uh, you know, or the sergeant said, I'm not a sir, I work for a living. Yeah, so that was my introduction to my national service call ups. And then another amusing incident that I do recall. Uh, was to the back end of was towards the back end of um, first phase, as you particularly as you all no doubt know as well. We had the commanding officers uh, in the final inspection, and if we passed the inspection, we could go home on our first weekend pass of our first weekend pass. Sorry, uh, during our training. And every morning, the three instructors, um, Sergeant Buzz Cummings, who was from SAS, Corporal Colin was from RLI, and Bill Hurley from RLI as well, who were my three instructors, were our three instructors would come into the barrack room and the first bed that they would come to, I was on the left-hand side of the dressing room, probably the fourth, fifth or maybe even the sixth bed, that bed done. And they would head to my bed. And I think Sergeant Cummings had a bit of a personality clash with me because as far as he was concerned, my bed layout was never good. My, there was always, I always had a shitty bed layout, as you would say, and he used to give me a hard time about it. And often I would get out two days or even three days of the week after guard duty is done in the magazine in the evenings. And looking around at my bed and the chaps sort of on each side of me, I, I could see no difference to my bed layout and their bed layout. But anyway, according to Sergeant Cummings, my bed layout was never ever up to scratch. Anyway, on the morning prior to the commanding officer's inspection, as per usual, seven or seven in the morning, the three instructors arrived and straight to my bed, straight to my bed. And uh, I can remember Buzz Cummings looking at me and he stood literally millimeters away from me. And he must have been a good six foot three, six foot four. And I can remember, he, as I say, he stood millimeters and he looked down at me like that with his light blue eyes and through his clenched teeth and said, Leith, if this effing barricum fails this effing inspection because of you, I'm going to personally take you into the toilets and F you up. And then after that, I'm going to let the rest of the barricum F you up as well. And, you know, that was, weren't quite the words of encouragement I was hoping to hear from my uh, kitchen sergeant. Anyway, on the, on the morning of the inspection, um, well, in the, on the evening prior to the inspection, we as a barricade, we split up into four different teams. One team went around the barricade and picked up all the stones and stompies and brushed and whatever you had to do. And I was with a team that was allocated to, to, to my execution chamber, to the um, shower areas, to go and clean the shower. So that was my... My duties are I went to the team chaps and we cleaned the showers, polished. One team went around the barricum and did the barricum. And the chaps who were commended on, always commended on their bed layouts, they went around the whole barricum and they made everyone's beds. And I can remember the morning of the inspection standing next to my bed. Now I was as chuffed as hell. I tell you what, I was as pleased because I was expecting that when Sergeant Cummings and Corporal Welsh and Hurley arrived at my bed for the first time ever. Sergeant Cummings was going to say to me, well done, Leith, you finally got this thing right. And anyway, so as I say, they walked into the barrack room and Sergeant Cummings uh, walked up to me. And before I get onto that, we, one of our commanding officer, one of our course officers, he had a daughter who was very easy with her wares. And if you were in the Llewellyn shop and she wanted Cokes or she wanted chips or whatever, and you bought them for her, she was quite willing to take you somewhere nice and quiet and show her, show you, uh, gratitude, her, her, her gratitude towards what you had bought her. And so I'll, I'll just call it Priscilla for this. And anyway, as I said, Sergeant Cummings arrived and he looked at my bed and he said, Yes, it looks like you've been shagging Priscilla in your bed all damn mud while the guys have been fixing the barricade around you. And I was mortified. I was absolutely mortified with that because I was expecting him to really commend me on how well the bed looked. And um, so yeah, with, with that, uh, I lost heart. And while 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 Sergeant Cummings were jumping on me, we heard the barricum next door, one platoon, barricum, barricum, shun, barricum, standard ease, and the commanding officer was next door. So the three instructors walked to the main door, the entrance of the barricum, and Corporal Walsh kept on going out, and he came back in and looked towards my bed and go out and come look, and they would whisper something. And then Corporal Walsh came back to me and said, Leith, you're not standing this damn election, uh, you're not, stand, you're not standing this inspection. You're gonna, I'm going to put you inside your cupboard and I'm going to close the door and after the inspection is over, I'm going to let you out. So that was it. I was bundled into my cupboard. The door was closed. And I was at a really, really odd angle. And after about five, six, seven minutes, 
I started to cramp in the back of my legs and small in my back and then my neck. And I was just about to shout out to be let out of the barrack room, out of my cupboard, when Sergeant Cummings also said, Barrack room, barrack room, shun. Barrack room. And the commanding officer was in the in the in, in our district, in our barrack room, and I couldn't do a thing. I, now I had to keep quiet. So anyway, the, the inspection went well. We passed the inspection, and now it's probably the first troopy that ever passed the, the CO's inspection from inside his cupboard. <laughs> and when the inspection was over, one of the chaps let me out, and I collapsed onto the floor, and there was general collapse. Panic, and I was picked up, put onto my bed. Corporal Welsh was, I um, went and they went and fetched Corporal Welsh, and he gave somebody some money to go and buy me two cokes and a packet of salt and wing and chips. And so, yeah, so that's how I was survived. I, I was given two packs of salt, I was given a pack of salt and wing and chips and two cokes to sort of get me right. So, those are my two re- uh, recollections of what time I spent at the well, At least you didn't have to perform any tricks for your two cokes like the young lady. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so the, the rest of my training went well. I, I'd like to consider myself to have been an above average troopy. Mm-hmm. And then um, I was posted to 147. Uh, I was posted to five independent company in Amtali. Uh, half the intake went to three independent Yanga. And I joined the chapter at five independent in, uh, in Amtali. And I had been at five independent, I don't know, uh, two months. We'd been at five independent for two months. And then the whole unit, the whole company, uh, one between and two between the whole NDEP, we were deployed to the uh, Boli airstrip in the Southeast uh, Ghana Resort game park. And I can remember, I think my first patrol, I went out in an eight-day patrol. And then we were recalled to camp for two days, like an R&R type thing. And we were deployed a second time. And we were only out for two days, possibly three days, when the signal came through that everyone, everyone that was out in patrol had been recalled back to... Um, Early airstrip. So we all went back again. Uh, nobody was told why we were being recalled, but all the units were recalled, all the platoons were, re- were recalled. And so we got back to camp and we were told that the next morning we were moving to uh, Maba, Maba Huta airstrip. But again, we weren't told why. So we were all given dinner and first thing in the morning we had breakfast and then we stripped down camp and off we went to Maba Huta. And when we got there, five end of where my we we moved in with the National Park Chaps right on the banks of the river. And um, so we'd been there for about a day. And the odd, really odd thing was W was I sent out in patrol, which we thought was really really odd. So we spent the night there, and the following morning, nothing happened as well. We went sent out in patrol. We nothing. Had, and then about four four in the afternoon, all the NCOs and the officers were called to go and shout for morning officer. And they were away for about an hour, hour and a half, and they all came back again. And the whole index was then called back to see the calling officer. And we were told that um, that evening at about seven, we were on our way to uh, we were going to do a base camp called Pufuri in the site in in the Mos- in Mozambique. So that evening at about seven, we all got into vehicles and we must have driven for two hours, three hours, maybe even four hours through that through the through the night. And surprisingly, we stopped at a safari camp in the Kruger National Park. So we'd actually driven into South Africa and we stopped at a, as I said, at a um, safari camp in the Kruger mm-hmm. National. And when we got there at around 10 o'clock at night, we were given two Buddha Wash rolls each and a, a cup of tea or coffee. Mm-hmm. And we were told to bed down and we were going to be waking up at about hoppers three, four in the morning for our walk into uh, Pufuri Base Camp. So that's what happened at about hoppers three, four o'clock. We were all woken up. Uh, Daryl, before you carry on, was it only your company um, that had gone yeah, in, in, into well, South Africa? Uh, or, initially or was there... only our, no, initially was only our company from that went, went that was driven to the night to Pufuri. Okay. When we got there, the RLI were there and RAR were there as well. Right. And there were a couple of Alouette choppers also uh, sort of scattered around the uh, safari camp. And, but we were going into stop groups. So we were split up into, I think, six stop groups of eight eight chaps per stop group and each stop group well two of the stop groups we had a, we had a salute scout with us as well so each scout was in charge of two stop groups so we started our walk into before it about four bells in the morning and it was really really dark and you could literally see the person in front of you so it was the case of you followed the sound in front of you mm-hmm. so we we were walking down this um, sort of obviously it was a dirt road and we'd been walking for about 20 minutes 25 minutes when there were these two distinct voices women's voices halt Put your hands in the air. And then there was another voice that said, Jacob. We also ducked it. And then the, the two women uh, 
Palumbo woman started firing down the road that we were on, and there were like green and red traces shooting down the road. And that happened for about 10, 15 seconds, and, and the firing stopped. They all went quiet. And we were in the ditches for probably about another 20 minutes, half an hour. And then the voice came back again. Okay, you guys, if you're all okay, get up. We're about to deploy it. We're about to, we're on the move again. And what happened is the scouts came along and said, we had to find out all our sick members again in case we were separated, rejoin those six, and we got to con continue the walking. And by then the sun was coming up, so it was quite easy to see. So I assume those women were um, like sentries or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they were sentries, right, before yeah. Yeah, So the, the game had been given away. You know? um, so the chaps said before he knew we were coming in. So anyway, so we, we started walking in. And as we were walking along, the, the scouts each, that, that were in charge of each of the groups would sort of veer off to the left, veer off to the right, and take their two sticks with them. And the stick that I was with, we carried on walking, and the chaps that were with us sort of disappeared. And then uh, the scout that was with us told us, okay, we were carrying on. So we, anyway, we walked for about another K or two down this dirt road. And by then the sun had come up, and they, we were surrounded by these like, thick clumps of um, mapani trees, like mapani trees all over the place. And, and we were a stop group, and we were on a main road, on a, on, on a main dirt road that was going actually towards the Pufuri camp itself. And at about half five, the airstrike went in. There were Cadenbras and there were hunters. But from our position, we couldn't see them at all. We could hear them. We could hear the hunters going in. We could hear the Cadenbras going in. We could hear all the firing. We could hear the Akaks going doof, 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 as, the, as the fights were flying over. But as I say, from our position, we couldn't see them at all. Anyway, the raid must have gone on for an hour, hour and a half. And then the choppers came in with Orelai and Oreo, and they were dropped into the uh, into the Pufuri camp itself. And we could hear the firing now and then. And then the firing stopped. And for about an hour and a half, there was nothing, not a sound. So the, the, the group I was with, um, we all stood up from our cover and we were standing on the on a dirt road to, going towards uh, Pufuri main camp. And we had been on the road for probably 10, 15 minutes, and all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. One of the um, attack positions on a hill, about two, three k's from us, actually spotted us, and they turned his gun on us, and he opened up on us. Da, 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 and the rounds were going through the trees about eight to ten feet above us, and we all ducked into cover. And I tell you, it was the most frightening, frightening experience I've ever, ever had in my whole life. But, you know, when you got rounds going eight, nine, ten foot above you, and branches are breaking off, and the do -do 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 and the firing went on for about 15, 20 seconds, and it stopped. But it felt like it had been going on for hours. So we, we remained in cover for probably another half an hour. And when the firing stopped, we all gradually stood up again and stood on the road. And then the firing started again. But this time around, the rounds were even going through the trees even lower. They're probably like five, six feet above us. And Tony, what I said was the most, I could hear the, my heart beating in my um, ears. And, and, in my, and when I looked down, I was expecting to hear the dust going around. My heart was beating so, so um, hard. And uh, was, were they yeah. actually were they actually exploding shells or fourteen point five? No, they weren't, no, they weren't exploding shells. No, they yeah. were just rounds that were going through the trees right. and um, probably a fourteen point five. And, but just the sound of those rounds going through the trees was the most terrifying experience I have ever, 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 ever experienced. So um, yeah, so when the firing stopped for the second time, um, we were all in position and we heard this kung 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 disappearing up up the road or into the distance. And when I turned around to have a look, it was our, our loot. And one of the stick members, they decided enough was enough and they kept it and they were going back, running up back towards uh, the road we'd walk, come in on. And the rest of us thought that we had supposed to have done a tactical retreat. So we all up and started running after our loot and, and our stick member. And we'd run about a hundred yards and then all of a sudden there was this noise from a ditch next to us, getting to effing cover. And was the scouts, one of the scouts that was with us, he and a couple of chaps who were lying in that ditch while the Akik was firing at us. And so we were there for an hour, possibly a little bit more. And then we all got up and the firing had stopped and we did our walk out of Mozambique. And I know our loot and the stick member were found three days later by the scouts somewhere in Mozambique. And our, load, our loot was sent to service. He never came back to five minutes as far as I recall. Uh, he was sent to services, and I think the stick member. In fact, I don't know what happened to the stick. But I don't remember where he was sent to. So, that's that's the first story I've ever heard of that type of thing happening. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I said, well, it was a really, really frightening experience. Right? I mean, like when you got rounds going through the trees, slightly above your head, 
it, it was it wasn't the best. So I, I can I can see why they decided it was time to go. Uh, so anyway, we, from my Bolo we, we we went back to Boli and we were in Boli for a week, another ten days. We did a couple more patrols, and then the whole company we we, we went back to Five Vendip in Naptali. Before you and, carry on with that, Daryl, um, did you ever get any feedback on on the enemy casualties at Bafiri? No, I, I had, not at all. No, I have no idea what happened there at all. I couldn't tell you at all. Yeah. I got a clue. Because I, I did a patrol through there in 77 or 78 and found a perfect skull with a hole from one temple to the other. I was, I was going to put it in my pack and use it as a lampshade, but um, <laughs> I, I felt, you know, disturbing a gravesite was not very really kosher. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, anyway, so you got back to... Uh, anyway, uh, so, as you say, um, from, my, from um, my Baluhuta, we went back to Bali for a couple of more days, and then we the whole unit returned back to Pavin and Amtali. And then while we were in Amtali, I got a little bit ill, and two platoon were deploying to the Hondi Valley, and I was quite ill that particular um, deployment, and so I was left behind in camp. And I had been back in camp a few days when our platoon's uh, medic, our chapel Jack Bobo, came back to camp and I was quite positive that he'd come back to camp to fetch me to see if I was okay. And if I was okay, he was going to take me back to the Hondi with him. So I hid away in the barrack room for two days. I, I wasn't particularly keen to go to the Hondi Valley because I, I'd been on patrols there before and it had rained literally every night from about 10 and four, three or four or five in the morning. And yeah, when you continuously wait for 24 hours a day, four days, five days in a row, it's not the best experience to have. So. So as I said, I, I hid away from Jack, uh, Jack for two or three days, and then hunger got the better of me. So I went down to the troops canteen and I started having lunch. And as I was having lunch, Jack walked in, but he was walked, He came in in his heavy clothes. So I said to Jack, Jack, what's going on? Why, why have you come back to camp? And he said that he he had been called up. He, he was going to university, and that day was his last day, and he was catching the train back that evening back to um, Salisbury, and he was going to go to Boston and sort um. University, he was going to do medicine at, at Boston. So I was quite pleased with that. And anyway, uh, a few days after Jack left, uh, our resident medic, also SAS, um, chap called Lionel Yeoman, uh, he put up a, a notice in the um, troops canteen that he wanted chaps to volunteer to do troop medic course. So as soon as I saw the um, notice, up, I went through the Sergeant German and I said, listen, Sergeant Yeoman, I'd really, really appreciate if I could do the troop medic course. And I told him that when I was at Brady, uh, when I was at the William doing basics, I had requested to become a medic, but because I wasn't sufficiently qualified, um, my request was turned down. And I'd really, really like to do this uh, medic course. And he wasn't too keen to let me do the course with him um, because uh, I didn't have a good reputation around camp at the time. Uh, so anyway, as I said, I asked him, uh, and he sort of told me different medic, thanks very much, but no, it wasn't going to happen. And Again, probably two days, three days later, a commanding officer and Sergeant Yeoman both came into the troop camp in one lunchtime. And again, um, our commanding officer said, listen, guys, he wants two or three chaps to volunteer as troop medics to do this course. And if nobody volunteers, he's going to nominate two chaps himself or chaps himself personally. So I went back to Sergeant Yeoman and I asked him for a second time, please, Sergeant, can I please do this troop medic course? You know, the long short of it. Well, a few days later, one of the chaps walked into the canteen and said, Leith, Sergeant, Sergeant Yeoman wants to see you. And I was initially under the impression that Sergeant Yeoman was going to tell me, uh, listen, Leith, thanks very much for your interest in doing the course, but I'll find the chaps who are going to do the course, and maybe next time I'll do the course, you can do the course with us. But that never happened. So I went back and saw him, and he said, okay, Leith, I've thought about it, and I'm going to give you the chance to do the troop medic course. So that was it. I started my troop medic course, but it came with one. Um, I should say it came with a with a with a term. Um, a caveat like a or a proviso, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it came. It, it came with. Um, yeah, it came with. Well, basically, what happened is that I, well, I was due for my first RNR. I hadn't had RNR since I had started my national service, and I, I was due for my RNR. And I commanding officer said, "Listen, if you do this course, your RNR is out the window. You have for another nine, ten weeks." And then once you've completed the um, what, uh, the two pretty course, you can go home and R and R. And I think they were hoping that I can say no, well, you know, maybe I won't do the course, but I said, okay, fine, I'll do the two pretty course. So so did I, I did the two pretty course. And the interesting thing about the two pretty course is, um, I, about a month into the course, we went around camp that the four hour 
for our, our motor platoon for coming into camp. We had a big tent in the uh, just up in the towards the motor transport garage, and we had units coming through on a regular basis. RLI came through initially, and then we had a unit of SAS came through for a while, and then RAR came, and they first stayed two or three weeks. And anyway, word went out that four on motor platoon were coming to set up camp um, down the five end. So one morning, well, one afternoon after lunch, I was just going up to the barrack room, and just by chance, I sort of looked out the window and I saw this convoy of vehicles right under the bottom end of camp coming towards camp. And I thought, yeah, these were the four R guys. So from the barrack room, I quickly went downstairs and I went down to the road on the um, coming into camp, waiting to watch the four R come in. And as they drove in, I, I was absolutely astounded because probably everyone on board, every vehicle, I knew personally from Bulawayo. And I thought, how is this humanly possible? that all these guys from Bulawayo were serving with a unit from Amtali. And everything inside of me, once the vehicles had gone past and parked down by the beach, and everything inside of me, I, I wanted to go down to the tent and go and find out how is it possible that all you guys from Bulawayo are serving with a, at a unit from Amtali. So what I did is I, I waited until dinner time, after dinner time, then I quickly raced down to the tent. And when I got there, I saw um, Captain Roy Pitchford, and I knew him well. I saw um, Chris Alves Mokeri. I played cricket against him. I played first league cricket in Bulaya. And I played for Bulaya Athletic Club, BSC. And uh, he played for OMS. And so we knew each other from cricketing days. And three of the chaps, Andre Stradham, um, Corey Lowe, and I can't think of that chap name, were all in the youth group. Um, Eddie Kiefer were all in the same youth group as, as me at church. At, at the church, I was going to Assemblies of God. So I went down and asked him, how is it humanly possible all you guys are serving with a, an Antali unit? And I said, no, 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 we're not Antali. We, we tore our motor team from Bulawayo. So anyway, because I knew most of the chaps, um, I used to go down to the tent literally on a daily basis. And turned how I think I probably became the first unofficial squatter in the Rhodesian Army because after about a week of motor platoon being there, I went back up to the tour, uh, two platoon barrack room. And when I say I emptied everything out of my cupboards, I mean I, I emptied my cupboards. There was nothing. I took everything out, put them to two sausage bags, I took them to a kit bag, I got my stretcher, I got my pillow from my bed, I got a blanket, and I headed down to the tour, to the tour on water platoon a tent, I pissed up, my, I found a spot, I put my stretcher up, and I moved in with them for the next five or six weeks. And the amazing thing was, neither Captain Pitchford, Roy Pitchford, nor Chris Albert Terry, who was, a, who was a W01, said to me, hey, Darryl, you know, you're not supposed to be, <laughs> maybe a, be a good plan to go back to your barrack room. None of them... And I eventually, as time went on, I became a member of an unofficial member of Water Team. I went to town with them, I drank with them, I did stand through with them, I cleaned troops with them in the mornings, I did guard with them in the evenings. So I became an unofficial member of Water Team. And then my troop medic course came to an end, and Water Team still had probably another 10 days, 12 days left with the camp. So I can remember saying to uh, Captain Pitchford one evening and down in the tent, Sir, would it be possible for me to? delay my r and by another 10, 12 days and come back to Bulaway with you. And uh, Captain Pitchford said, as far as he's concerned, he's got no problem with that at all, but it wasn't his decision to make. I had to go and speak to my own commanding officer and ask him and if, if, if it was okay with um, my CEO, and then by all means, I could come back with him. So that's what I did. I went back straight up to the uh, offices. I saw the secretaries. I made an appointment with the next morning officer. And the following morning, Nine tenish, I went to our CEO and I said to him, Sir, would it be possible if I delayed my R and R by another ten, twelve days? Uh, so I can back can go back to Bulaway with Toram Water Platoon. So he said to me, At least he doesn't care when I do my R and R, when I take my R and R, he just hopes that when I go back with to Bulaway with Water to when I go back to Bulaway with Water Platoon, I can stay with him. And little did he know he had just speak, spoken words of release. Because that's literally what happened. So anyway, 10 days, 12 days later, when Water Platoon had camp had come to an end, we all uh, got onto the vehicles. And as we were driving out of camps, a couple of the two platoon chaps uh, were standing on the same road that I was standing on that when they arrived in camp. And as I went past, as I said, I, I wasn't really well liked amongst my fellow troopies. And I was sworn at and I was given a hard time. And somebody threw a stone at me, which sort of missed me, and hit the cab of the uh, vehicle I was on. And we drove from, uh, after I was leaving, um, Captain Pitchford said to us, right, what's going to happen is we're going to drive from here to KG6 in, uh, in Salisbury. We're going to refuel KG6, and from KG6, we're going to push through to the Troopies Camp 
to the Tripi's canteen in Kwekwe. And if we get there in time, we're going to stop, have somebody eat and drink, and then pass on to Bulawayo. And Captain Pitchford also said that if we do manage to stop in time at the Tripi's canteen, he wants the guys to leave fairly good donations to the... So anyway, that's what we did. So as we drove out of camp, um, I can remember looking back at camp, you know, and, and, and I got this lump in my throat and, and tears filled my eyes. I'm not, I'm not fri- scared to say that. And I, and I realized how well, how much dislike I was in, in, in the army with most of my fellow tri- tributes. But as we drove out, it was just, I just had this uncontrollable feeling inside that this was a loss. This was my last time I'll be back if I've been there. It was the most extraordinary feeling you could ever imagine. Anyway, so that was it. Off we went. Uh, we stopped at KG6. We refueled at KG6. And then Captain Pitchford said, right, we're pushing on to uh, Kwekwe. And we're going to make a stop in Kwekwe. So off we went. And we got to Kwekwe. It was probably about five ish. And as we got there, the ladies were in the process of closing the um, Kupi's canteen. And when we arrived, they all stopped, reopened the canteen, and they let us in. And so we all, we, we were really grateful to the ladies for sort of reopening the canteen to us because we had nothing to eat and drink literally from the time we left Antali. And while I was sitting at a table with Corey Lowe and um, Andre Stradham, Captain Pitchard and uh, W01 Chris Osmond Kerry came to the table I was sitting at and they asked if they could join us. So we all said, yeah, no problem at all. So they sat with us. And then Chris Osborne Curry said to me, Daryl, what was all that about when we left uh, Five Minutes? Why was everyone? So basically, I, I, re, I, re, I sort of told the story about my, my, my time spent at Five Minutes and that type of stuff. And, and then at the same time, I said to Captain Pitchford, you know, would it be at all possible for me to transfer from my national service, from Five Minutes to um, Five to Tehran, to, 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 to complete my national service? And basically, as most commanding officers would have said, uh, you know, that's going to be literally impossible because you're still a national serviceman. And for a national serviceman to transfer to a TF unit was the unheard of thing. It, it would probably never ever happen. So anyway, so I left it at that and we were back on the vehicles at about six or seven. We made our way back to Buruwa. And I can remember as we started driving to Glen Gary, driving, uh, as we were driving up, up the injury up the main road towards the, and there's last four on each side of the road and the civilian cars would drive past us and beep 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 and wave and that type of stuff and I don't think there was a dry eye on, on any of the vehicles you know with the, the appreciation of you know, you're coming up from the camp and the people appreciate you coming back again so even now I get emotional about it so yeah that was a really good experience and then um, when we got back to Brady um Captain Pitchford said that all the drivers had to go and put their um, vehicles in the in the cage, and we had to be back at camp the following morning. Well, the chaps had to be back in camp the following morning, following morning at nine, to clean all the vehicles, hand back stuff to the stores, hand back stuff to the armories, and then once that had been done, they could collect their pay, and the camp was over. And Captain Pitchford said to me, Daryl, I want you back at camp at eleven o'clock, um, because myself and Chris Osborne Carey, W One Osborne Carey, I have got a uh, a debriefing with the CEO of, of Tuara, and when the debriefing is over, we'll take you through and you can have a chat with him and see if he can organize anything for you. So the next morning at about 8, I got when my mom was on her way to work, I got her to drop me off at Brady. And when I walked down to Tuara, to Tuara Alliance, I thought I was going to be the only one there. I'm to, uh, but most of the chaps from Watertune were already there cleaning vehicles and your stuff back. So I joined in and I, clean, I started cleaning vehicles with the chaps. I was helping with do stuff back to the armories. And Captain Pitchard and Osborne Carey arrived about half an hour later. And when they saw me, they were quite impressed that I'd been there. And anyway, so Captain Pitchard reminded me, okay, listen, Daryl, you have call, come back to the offices. And um, as soon as I did briefing as I'll take you to the see Colonel French. So I said, okay, fine. And 11 o'clock came and I went and sat in the tour offices. And I waited for Captain Pitchard and uh, Chris Osborne Carey to finish the briefing. And 11 came, half 11 came, quarter to 12 came, and probably 12 ish came, and there was no sign of them. And I genuinely thought that they'd probably forgotten all about me and already gone home. And I was just about to get up and leave and to, to go back, to go home. And um, Chris and Captain Pitchford came out of the office and he apologized. He said the meeting had taken a bit longer than, um, than, than they'd been expected. And so he took me into Colonel French. And um, so Colonel, he introduced me to Colonel French, who at the time was a commanding officer of Tura R. And um, Captain Pitchford and Oswald Kerry asked me to please just 
tell Colonel French about my experiences back at Five Inlet, which I did do. And like Captain Pritchard, I, I said to Colonel French, sir, would there be an opportunity or even the remotest possibility that she could organize a transfer for me from Five Inlet to Toram Woodington to complete my national service? And he, like Colonel Fr uh, like he, like Captain Pitchford said that he didn't have the rank structure to um, grant me uh, a transfer. But what he would do is he would send me to see his very good friend who was the commanding officer of one brigade. And I could go and have a chat with the CEO of one brigade and maybe he could help me out. So with that, my Colonel French friend, uh, commanding officer of one brigade, and they had a casual conversation for a couple of minutes. And, and then Colonel French, to my utter and total amazement, said to the commanding officer of one brigade, uh, my, my very good friend, uh, one of my very good friends is in the office with me, and he, he's got a problem, and he thinks, Colonel French thinks that possibly he, the commanding officer of one brigade, can, could help me out. Can he send me to see the CO of one brigade? So the CO of one brigade said to me, well, said to Colonel French, well, as long as I get there before one o'clock, before lunchtime, uh, he'll see me straight away. So from Toro, I uh, went straight down to the um, CEO of One Brigade and I saw the ladies at the reception area and I said, I'm here to see the CEO of One Brigade. Uh, he was expecting me. So uh, the lady took me through to the office, to the CEO's office. And Tony, I'll tell you, as I walked in his office, you talk about being astounded. As I walked in, I had known the CEO of One Brigade for three, four years. I had, I'd, I'd, I'd spent a lot of time. I had no clue what his name was. Um, I played cricket for command always, uh, reservedly cricket. And he was one of the regular dominoes players. So he was literally there on a daily basis playing dominoes with, with the chaps, uh, the elderly chaps sort of in the, in the pub. And as I say, for three years, four years, while I'd been playing, playing cricket for command always on a Saturday, uh, I'd often spoken to him, but I had no clue what his name was. So anyway, as I walked into his office, uh, we looked at each other and we recognized each other. And he asked me, he told me he hadn't seen me around. And I stopped playing cricket and I said, no, I'm doing national service. Uh, no, and that's why he hadn't seen me at camp. So we, we got into a conversation and and then he said to me, uh, I believe Cedric, who is Colonel <laughs> French, uh, has sent you to see me and uh, you, you have a problem that I can possibly help you out with. And so I said to him, I basically went back into detail again with him, what I told Colonel uh, French about my time spent at 5 minutes. And would there be an opportunity at all, or possibility at all, for him to organize for me a transfer to complete what would have, should have been my last probably five weeks or six weeks of national service and transfer across to Woodbridge and complete the national service there? So like Colonel French and like um, Captain Pitcher, he basically said, you know, the, 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 the chances are probably very, very slim. But leave it with him, uh, and he would make a few phone calls, and he would see what he could organize. So that was it. I left it at that. And I left his office and a few days later, early one morning, uh, my mom came and woke me up one morning and she said, there's my boy, what have you done? So I said, why? So she said, uh, there's two army policemen waiting in the lounge for you. They're taking you back to the army, meaning back to Brady Barracks. So I jumped out of bed and I walked up the lounge and I had a peek into the uh, dining room and there was a white sergeant and a black um, MP waiting for me. And when they saw me, they said, uh, Ralph and Lise, uh, we've been sent to fetch you by the commanding officer of one brigade. He went, they want you back at one brigade. And I went back to my room. And my mom folded me in. She said, Dazzy, my boy, what have you done wrong? And I generally, truth and honestly, could not for the life of me think why these cops had come to, why well, the MPs had come to fetch me to take me. I thought I was going to the box. Uh, I really did. I was going to DB. And I got into a state of panic. So anyway, I got changed. Uh, and I walked out, I walked out into the lounge. I followed the two MPs out and the, the Land Rover was parked outside. And I thought what I was going to do, I was going to jump on the back of the uh, Land Rover. And then when we got into town, into like a really busy section of Buller, I was going to duck, jump off the back of the Land Rover, duck into town, hide away, and then make my way home again, get some money, get my passport, and possibly make a duck, because I was quite certain I was going to the box. And anyway, as we got to the Land Rover, the white P, uh, MP said to me, I must sit up front with him, in the front of the vehicle with him. And that, that was it. I, my, my, I was naked. My, my plan to jump off the vehicle had come and gone. So from the house all the way to Brady Barracks, it was complete and total silence. So the, the white MP and the black guys spoke to each other all the time, but I never said a word. I never spoke. Of, and by the time I got to Brady, I, I was now in a state of sheer panic. I had a, a thirst on me like you couldn't believe. 
I was trembling. I was probably as white as a sheet. And I just could not think why I had been sent out going to the box. So anyway, we, we went into one brigade and uh, we went down to see the commanding officer of uh, one brigade and I went to his office. And he must have seen straight away that there was something wrong with me because he said to two uh, MPs, thanks very much, and he dismissed them. He said to me, oh, you're okay. You, you're very, very white and you're pale. Would you like something to drink? And I said, yes, please. And so he poured me a glass of water, which I went down really quickly. Uh, and then he said to me, right, would you like the good news or would you like the bad news? And I was completely totally at a loss. I had no clue whatsoever what he was talking about. So I sort of sat and looked at him with that, probably with a blank look in my face and said, right, um, the good news is uh, you can finish your R&R, &R, uh, but the bad news is at the end of your R&R, &R, you have to go back to 5 NDEP and you're going to have to clear and then come back to Bulawayo and then you can rejoin, you can join Water Platoon uh, to complete your national service. And it took a bit of while for that penny to drop because I sort of, I can remember sitting and looking at him and thinking, what the hell is this guy talking about? And then the penny dropped. And unfortunately, my military protocol at the time went out the window big time uh, because I dashed around his <laughs> I dashed around his table and I got hold of him and I hugged him. I said, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And I, I'll tell you what. Anyway, so the longest one, yeah, that was it. My military protocol went out the window and I, my transfer to five, from five ended to mm -hmm. uh, Torah Mordepin had been granted. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, so it, I, was, I was really pleased about that. And, okay. Right, so from Colonel's office, uh, Colonel French's office, I, I went down to the railway station. I booked a train to um, um, Tali. I went back to um, Tali and I cleared. And I came back to Bulawayo. And then um, I joined Water Platoon. And our first camp, our very first camp, I was sent to Villa Salazar. And it was a camp of note. I'll tell you what. Um, we had been there for two weeks, possibly three weeks. And one afternoon, uh, PSYOPs arrived and a couple of other units arrived. And uh, what had happened is um, a couple of weeks prior to this, the scouts had been in, in, in the Malvernia area and they stopped a convoy of vehicles and they had taken mail off of one of these vehicles, sent it back to a special branch and special branch had gone through the mail and then doctored it a little bit. And with water, with water between, we had a chap called Joe Azavado, who was Portuguese. So anyway, as I say, PSYOPs arrived and a couple of other units arrived and that evening, uh, during dinner time, Captain Pitchford said to us that um, what was going to happen in the following morning, he wanted us all to man the pits by six in the morning. It was um, Joe Azavado was going to go down to the front gate with a loud hailer, um, and he was going to start reading the mail back to the Freddies on the other side of the border, and he was expecting that things weren't going to go down too well, and uh, we were going to get a bit of a stomp. So anyway, uh, six o'clock the next, next morning, we had our breakfast and we all went to the various pits. I was allocated to Richard Horsey's pit as his, as his number four. And um, yeah, so as I said, Joe Azovado and a couple of chaps from uh, PSYOPs, or Psy um, it was PSYOPs, whatever they call themselves, and a couple of chaps went right to the front to the front um, offices um, at, at, at Villas. And Joe started reading the mail back to the various Freddies that were based across the other side of the border at Malvernia, and for probably the first five or ten minutes, nothing happened. And then the first set of rounds started coming in, and I tell you, we had a stomp from hell. Mm -hmm. The stomp went on for about six or seven hours, and when I say literally non-stop, I mean that literally went on for non-stop. To the extent, Captain Pitchford, Pitchford had to radio um, to, uh, to Reggie, and he requested to Reggie that we have an airstrike uh, to bring the um, stomp to an end. So that's what happened. We um, Teresa got hold of the blues, and like 20 minutes, 25 minutes later, the hunters came over. The cameras came over. Sorry, but they were flying at a tremendous height, and they each dropped thousand pound bombs. And the war came to an end uh, for six or seven weeks. And then my camp at Villas came to an end, and I went back to Bulawayo. And I um, went home on the right Before you move on, before you move on from uh, that, Daryl. Um, um, uh, you're probably one of the few uh, guys outside of special services that have been near um, a thousand pounder that was dropped. Can you just describe what it was like, the impact, the noise, the shock wave? Okay, yeah, yeah. What What did you experience? Okay, so as I say, um, when the two thousand pounder bombs were dropped, the, the pilot said to us that we had to get down undercover. So we all got down undercover, and. Something quite amazing, I, I, we, we felt the shockwave come through the ground before we actually felt it, heard the actual explosion. And then we heard the, dolo, dolo. 
and bricks and roofing and all that. We, we must have been about a good K, K and a half from uh, Villas itself, from Melvernia itself. And we had like a shower of bricks and tin roofs and asbestos roofs falling into camps. And that's how heavy those, those bombs were. They were, they must have been mean. They must have left creatures, you know, creatures that you cannot believe. So anyway, as I say, my, my camp eventually came to an end because I was flying well, Sorry, before you move on, um, we, the last time we, we chatted, uh, you, you talked about the actual setup at um, at the water pits there. There was like a command bunker with a camera yeah, in yeah. it, camera in it yeah. or a, a, a screen or something uh, or a telescope where you could see the other side. Yeah. And could you give a little bit of detail on that and also... Where were you guys during the six hour raid? Were you just in slip trenches or in actual no, bunk in bunkers? Yeah. So basically, um, what happened is um, at, at Villas, we had a command bunker. And in the command bunker, in front of the command bunker, we had a, um, like a, a, a tower that must have been 60, 70, maybe 80 foot tall. It was a really, really tall tower. And we had a camera on top of it. And we used to take turns to sit in the command bunker during the day and sort of view into Mozambique and try and find, um, see what the Freddies were doing across the other side. And that type of stuff. And during the stonk, we had a stonk. Um, we had a chap who was permanently on the camera and he would sort of scan the camera backwards and forwards, trying to look for targets to, to fire at. So yeah, so that was, uh, and then at Villas, we had six, uh, during the six hour stonk, uh, basically we were out in the open. We had pits, um, we, we had seven pits, uh, one to seven. And Rick was, my pit that I was in with Rick, of course, yeah, I was in number six pit with Rick. And so, yeah, so the amazing thing is of all the camps that we had ever done at Villas, bar one, uh, when 9 RO were there, one of their chaps was killed. But prior to that, nobody in Toro had ever got injured, ever got killed, ever. So, yeah, so we, we were quite lucky in that uh, aspect of um, being at Villas. Because as I say, all the pits were open air. It was just a case of a tube. Uh, get behind the uh, tube, fire your bombs, and that was it. Duck under cover again. <laughs> so as I say, my R&R, &R, uh, my national, my, I was due for R&R, &R and I was sent back to um, uh, Bulawayo. And um, during my R&R, &R, when my R&R &R came to an end, I went back to uh, Toro, expecting to be deployed back to Villas again, or wherever Toro and Water Between were camping. And that particular time, for some odd reason, our tour motor between weren't being deployed for the next six, six weeks. So I was told that what I was going to do is uh, I was going to work in the offices. I could work in the offices, offices, helping the lady clerks out for the next six weeks. And then once the six weeks was over, I would deploy again with motor between back to Villas. So I, I'd been in the offices at about a week, 10 days, and I got really, really bored with the work I was doing there. And one lunchtime, I walked past one med company. And I went back and I went in again and I inquired about when was the next medics course being held. And I was told it was being held probably like a week, a week later. So I asked if I could please do the course. And the chap I spoke to said, I had to go back and get clearance from my commanding officer. Once I got clearance from him, he had to contact uh, one med company and nominate me to do the course. So at the time, uh, Booty York, Major York was our commanding officer. Colonel Francis Camp had come to an end and he had gone home. So Major York was our commanding officer. So I went and made an appointment with Colonel York, uh, Captain uh, Major York and I asked him if I could clear do the medics course. And he got hold of one med company, nominated me, and I started my medics course. And uh, when the course was over, naturally I thought that I'd be returning to Mortimer because they were the ones who sent me on the course which uh, th that never happened. So my first camp as a qualified medic, I was sent to Dr. Terenzi and I spent six weeks with um, Pat Johnson from, from RAR and Captain John Leyland as well from RAR. And was and that, as, was that as, as an MA1 or an MA3? As an MA3, as an MA3 medic. MA3, yeah. so that's quite a, a senior uh, no, medieval. no, that was that was the beginning. The MA one was the more higher. Oh, I see. It got it back MA3 to front. MA three was at the three it's the three months medical course. That was your basic, and then you progressed to MA two, then MA one. And, so and, I, 
that entitled, uh, entitled you to do uh, drips, pack chop wounds, I, and that type of thing? You could do drips, you could do sutures, we, we could right. basically do quite a fair amount of stuff. Okay, fair um, So when I went to Tredgy with Dr. Leyland, I'll tell you what, we used to go into theatre literally on a daily basis. And I absolutely loved my time there. I really, really did. And like all, all things, all good things come to an end. And um, Captain uh, John Leyland, uh, his camp came to an end. Well, his national service actually came to an end, and about ten days before my camp came, he he left uh, and he he, he 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 left and he returned to Bulawayo because uh, his uh, national service was over. And then a few days after him, Pat Johnson also left uh, his camp. He had been transferred back somewhere else, and we got a Dr. Louis Shulman came. Um, he took over from John Leyland, and um, so I only worked with Dr. Shulman for a few days, and then. Um, my camp came to an end. I went back to Bulawayo. I had my R&R. &R. And then for some unknown reason, Tony, why it happened, I have no idea. But I was sent back to Dr. Ford Vic. And I was sent back as the senior, the senior medical officer. And all senior medical officers, as far as I'm aware, were captains and majors and above. They were qualified doctors. But for some odd reason, uh, I was sent to Dr. Ford Vic as the SMO, the senior medical officer. And I got there on a Wednesday. And on the Monday morning at about nine o'clock, I heard a knock, 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 knock on my uh, in my room door, and it was one of the MPs. And they said, uh, "Doc, uh, they're waiting for you at the security at the security meeting. Uh, you you are required to attend it." So off I went to the security meeting, and as I walked in, I recognised uh, Ron Reed Daly, and I recognised Bert Sachs from when I was based at Terezi, because I'd seen Bert Sachs a couple of times. And so I sat down in the meeting, and I, for the next hour and a half, I was absolutely captivated with it. I heard all the information, the highly sensitive information that was going on around in Rhodesia, and that, that where the scouts who had were, were operating, what was going on, what contacts were going on, where the tours were, and I was absolutely captivated. And when the meeting came to an end, I wanted to jump up and say, "Hang on, hang on, can't we carry on for a little bit more?" Anyway, so the following Monday. <laughs> With much eagerness, I rushed down to the ops tent again, and I sat in the meeting, and and the meeting started. And for some reason, after I'd been there about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I started looking around. Now, I was dressed in a pair of shorts, a green camo t-shirt, and fillies with no socks on. And I looked around, and everyone else around me were fully dressed in, in, in kit, uh, like we had like lieutenant, we had lutes, captains, majors, we had a lieutenant colonel and we had a brigadier and they were all dressed in full kit and held me sitting in the uh, amongst these chaps as a corporal listening to this, <laughs> listening to this highly sensitive information. <laughs> and for the next month, I absolutely <laughs> dreaded going, going to the uh, security meeting because yeah. I was so frightened that I was going to be found out that, that I was only a corporal sitting amongst all these officers <laughs> listening, listening to highly sensitive in, information. So yeah, so that was my uh, introduction to uh, Dr. Ford Vic. So thankfully, after a couple of weeks, my camp at Dr. Ford Vic came to an end and I was back to Blue Air and I went home an hour and hour again. And one night I was at the Electric Circus and um, which was a disco in Blue Air, And a few of the chaps from Waterton camp were, were there as well. And we got talking and we drinking, drinking together as, as per the norm. And they told me, listen, uh, we, we're going back to Villas in about a week's time. Why don't you go and find out if you can come back to Villas with us as our medic? So I thought, hey, that was a good idea. So Monday morning, the first thing, uh, I went down to one med company at Brady, and I said, I'd like to volunteer to go back to Toram Water Petunia. They sent me on this medic's course, and when I qualified, um, instead of going back to Water Petunia, I was sent to Dr. Reggie, then I was sent to Dr. Fort Vic, and I said, the chaps are going to Villas, please, can I do the camp with him? And... So the chap that I saw, the commanding officer I saw, who I have no idea who he was, uh, he arranged for me to compete my, uh, for my next camp to go to Villas with um, the chaps from Wadipatun. So on the day before we were due to, due to deploy to Villas, uh, I went back to one mid-company, I, I drew my pannula, um, I went, took a walk around to tour on Wadipatun, uh, well, to tour on lines. And um, I saw Ron Ellsworth, Ron El Lieutenant Ron Ellsworth Kerry, um, and a couple of the sergeants that, and I told him I was doing the camp with them. 
and uh, I was really looking forward to going to Villas with him the next morning. And Lieutenant uh, Osborne Carey said, Villas? We said we're going to Villas. We're not going to Villas. We're, we're going back to Antari. We're going back to Five Bendep. I thought, oh, oh. Anyway, so, yeah, so... Back to your hellhole. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I had to go back and face my demons, I tell you. Yeah. So, anyway, the next morning, uh, we left camp at about, must about 10 in the morning, and like the first camp I did, we drove from Bulawayo up to KG6. We refueled the KG6, and then we made a night stop in Marindellis that night. And then the following morning, uh, quite surprisingly, I was made Richard Corsi's assistant driver. So, Rick basically drove from Bulawayo all the way to Marindellis. And then the following morning from Marindellis to, Bulo, uh, to back to five end of Namtali, Richard to me, okay, he's had enough of driving. I can drive the vehicle. We were driving a two five. I was on the um, fuel, uh, uh, the fuel houses behind me. So I drove the vehicle from uh, Marindellis to back to Amtali. And it was quite a weird experience you know, going back and uh, now coming back as a, as, as, a, as a fully qualified medic and just seeing the chaps I'd worked with or the chaps from Five Indep who, who had been, who had known from the past. Yeah, that's it. So that was quite some, quite, quite a nice experience going back and just seeing all the chaps again. And then about four days before my camp was due to come to an end, uh, I was sitting in the tent playing cards with the chaps and um, the duty signaler from Five Indep came in and he wanted to know was the starlight uh, available. So one of the chaps from Wilton, I have no idea who it was, he said, Doc, there's somebody here to see you. So I said, okay, fine, I'll be with you. No, no, I'm just about to finish my hand, uh, my, the, 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 the game of cards we were playing. And when I was finished the game of cards, I, I went across to this chap. And he said to me, there's a chopper on its way to fetch you. It'll be arriving in about 15 minutes' time. You're on your way to Ruda. Uh, there's a chap from Orla who'd been shot in the head uh, during a contact. And you were on your way to do the, the to, to go and collect him. So I said, thanks very much. And with that, I walked over to my pannula, opened my pannula. I remember I put a couple of drips in. I put the first, first, few, first few dressings in. I put a, first, a couple of bandages into my um, backpack as well. And the signal also said it might be a plan if you take a change of clothing because you're going to be flying with the Kazakh back to Solvi and you're only going to come back tomorrow morning. So I said, okay, fine. And with that, I packed, as I said, I packed my kit bag. I put King, a set, new set of clothing into my kit bag, walked out of the tent. And as I walked out, I said to the chaps, please tell uh, uh, Lieutenant Telson Kerry, um, that I'm going to Ruda and I'm only coming back tomorrow. I'm going out to do Kazakh and that's where I can find. So I walked out of the tent, I walked past the guard room and about 50, 60 yards behind the, tour, uh, the uh, five in the guard room was a chopper landing pad. And I'd been standing at the landing pad for five, six or minutes and then I heard that very, very distinct distant sound of an elevator approaching. And I can remember from the landing pad looking up towards uh, Amtali Hut where um, the, the wise oh hotel was uh, was based, was built. And I can remember looking up at the wild wild oh, waiting to see the chopper coming over the over the top of the hill and flying towards camp. And the noise got louder and louder and louder and there was still no sound, no sign of this chopper whatsoever. And I can remember it was a bit odd. And uh, anyway, a couple of minutes later the chopper flew in towards camp, but it came in a treetop level from Amtoli. It came in from Amtoli town centre where it's like flew in a treetop level landed it literally was on the ground for 10 seconds the top of tech top and get on we took off again we did 180 degree turn and turn to our left and we flew back at tree top level back towards Amtali town center uh we must have flown about 15 20 minutes 20 seconds past Amtali town center, and then we did a right hand turn and we started to climb up and over uh the Amtali heights and we flew towards Judah. and i can remember sitting in the top and looking down at all the the terrain around me and just uh, taking in uh, all the various sites and us. Uh, and then about 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, the pilot, pilot pointed to the front of the airplane, pointed to the front of the chopper. And way in the distance, we could see um, Ruda in the distance. Anyway, a couple of minutes later, we eventually landed at Ruda. And we taxied up, and there were two Land Rovers and a 2-5 uh, Unimog ambulance parked on the side of the runway. So we taxied up to the Closer to the two vehicles, and the pilot shut down. And once we shut down, 
he gave me the signal, okay, you can get off. So like uh, naturally what I would have done is I got off the chopper and I walked across to the um, 25 ambulance. And as I got there, uh, I assumed it was the medic from the RLI. He opened the back door of the um, of the um, 25 and Baz was on the stretcher on the back of the ambulance. So we hauled Baz out and he told me to take the front of the stretcher. And so we hauled him out to he was almost out. And then the medic from RLI took the back of the stretcher. And I can remember looking down at Baz's eyes and I could not, I, I, I was absolutely astounded. It looked like somebody had got a tennis ball, cut the thing in half, shaved it all up, painted them purple, and put two little slits in them and put each like half over each of bezel. His eyes were that swollen and they were as purple, purple. I tell you, Tony, I, I couldn't believe how, how somebody's eyes could swell that much. Anyway, so to cut a long story short, myself and the uh, medic from RLI, took a bez and we put him down next to the chopper. We didn't put him into the back of the chopper and the chopper tech was slowly fueling. And then a few minutes later, once he'd refueled and done the um, pre-flight check, he, he said to us, okay, we could, bez, we could put bez back into the back of the chopper, which we did do. And then when we did that for the first time, since we had been there, um, whether it was the RLI doctor or whether it was another medic, I have no idea. But anyway, he walked over to me, he gave me Three drips. He gave me a saline. He gave me a dextrose, and he gave me a, a reverend drip, which is a small little orange drip. And he said, uh, when the drips start, when Baz's drips start running low, uh, obviously must uh, change them around and get the new ones up and going. But he said to me, he didn't think that uh, I was going to need them. In other words, implying that he didn't think Baz was going to make it back to um, Salisbury. He thought Baz would. And uh, as a new medic, doing my first actual official cataract, you know, that that was the last thing I wanted to hear that my Kazik was probably going to die on me. So anyway, as I said, we, we got back into the back of the chopper. The pilot said to me that we're going to be flying to Grand, uh, we're going to be flying to Antali airstrip. And having done, having spent five months of my national service in Antali, when he said the Antali airstrip, I naturally assumed Grand Reef. So we started the chopper, we took off and we flew back towards, basically in the same direction as we came and we, and we were going. And then I started to recognize all the train below us again. And we started getting closer to Amtali. And we flew over the Amtali hut. And I could see Amtali town center to my left. And I could also see five minutes in the distance. And I thought there'd been a change of plan. I thought, no, we're probably uh, not going to Grand Reef anymore. And we were probably going to go to Amtali Hospital. And we were going to land there. Until we flew over and past Amtali Hospital. And we carried on going. And I can remember thinking to myself, this pilot is seriously lost. He has no clue where Grand Reef is. We know we near Grand Reef. And I tapped the chopper tech on his shoulder and I said to him, hey, chap, the pilot is seriously lost. We know we near Grand Reef. He's lost his way. And, and the chopper tech turned around and he smiled at me. He said, no, 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 no. And then he actually pointed down below. And I looked down out of the aircraft. And in this valley, there was this grass airstrip, yeah. uh, which I had no clue that was actually there. So we landed there. And I can remember before, prior to leaving Ruda, the, the um, chopper pilot said to me that there was going to be a mantle or a fixed, fixed air wing um, uh, aircraft waiting for us to fly Basel and I to Salisbury. So we landed. Uh, there was no fixed wing waiting for us at all. So uh, the chopper tech and I left Basel on the back of the on the on the back of the chopper, and we basically just walked around having a look at the the area and that. And we'd been there about 10 minutes and then the pilot called us back again and said he'd been trying to raise uh, the, air, the police air wing pilot and couldn't get him. So he had ready at Grand Reef and there was an aircraft in the same bar there for us. So we're going to fly from there back to Grand Reef and um, from there I'll fly back to Solvi with Antoli, uh, fly back to Solvi with Abbas. So we both climbed back into the chopper and as we did the, the police uh, uh, fixed air wing came, flew over us. It flew around in like half a circle and landed right at the top end of, and basically much the same. It taxied down to the run, down to where we were stationed, where we were stopped, and it stopped. So the chopper tech and I took Baz out and we put him down on the floor next to the chopper. And when the uh, police uh, aircraft had stopped, the pilot came over to us and he apologized. He said they'd been having trouble getting the back seat out in uh, Salisbury, uh, and that's why he was late. And so the tech situation, so we put Baz on, can we, the tech asked the pilot, can we put Baz on the aircraft? He said, yeah, if you can. 
So Beza, so myself and the tech 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 picked Baz up and we started walking to the towards the aircraft and the next minute they were just shut and the stretch and bounce. And I got a fight because I thought the top of tech had probably slipped and fallen. So I stopped and I turned around to have a look at him and I looked at our Baz. Baz was sitting up on his stretcher looking at me. And for the first few seconds you know, nothing registered. I, I, I was thinking, how in hell's name is this possible? He's supposed to be in a serious condition. <laughs> and then here he is sitting up on the stretcher trying to get off of it. So myself and the tech put our beds down. And we pushed him down and, we, and I asked him to bed, uh, listen, beds, you really seriously injured. You need to lie down, keep quiet, still. We're about to take you to Amtoli. Uh, we're about to take you to Solby, the hospital there. And anyway, so Baz lay down and he kept quiet for a couple of seconds and, and myself and the chopper team picked him up again and started walking back towards the airplane. And again for the second time, Baz jumped up again and he tried to get off the stretcher and he was shouting. And by now the uh, the police air wing pilot, his eyes were sort of like getting like sources and he took it back to the cigarettes out of his pocket and, he's, <laughs> and he lit his first cigarette and he walked around his aircraft. <laughs> and this time around the chopper tech Pushed Baz down and told Baz just to keep quiet, now that he was really badly injured, and we needed to get him to a hospital ASP. And this happened about two or three or four times uh, where Baz would actually sit up and uh, uh, try and off the top, and to the extent that the fixed air wing pilot, he started getting to a flap, and because he was getting to a flap, was putting me into a flap, and he was saying to he was saying to me, if I, I must sedate Baz, I must sedate Baz, as he's not flying us back to. Uh, Salisbury, and, and I can tell you what uh, I, I was in a state you cannot believe. So I opened my um, medical, I opened my backpack, knowing full well that the only thing I had in there were, were drips, first fuel dressings, a couple of bandages, and that was it. And I started scratching around in my um, kit bag for something I knew I didn't have. And Tony, to my utter total amazement, who put them there? How they got there, I honestly, truth me, hand on my heart, I genuinely, truth me, to this day, cannot tell you. And and of course. I was scratching my um, backpack. There were, three, there were three vials of Valium, and there were a couple of syringes in my back. As I say, who put them in the hub? And it was definitely wasn't the doctor or, or, the, or the medic that I, I'd phoned in from, that had been at, at Rudy with. So anyway, I, I took out this first vial, um, vial of um, morphine, uh, first vial of Valium, sorry, and I was shaking it. I even struggled to break the little cap. And I eventually managed to get the needle into um, a syringe with a um, needle on it. And I eventually managed to get it, and I, and I injected it into Baz's drip. And Baz went quiet. He lay back and he went quiet. And I thought, oh, oh thank goodness, my, my, my worries are over. So myself and the tech picked, picked Baz up for the last time. As we, got him, as we started pushing him into the back of the plane, Baz jumped up again and he tried to get off the stretcher and I got such a fright. Myself and the tech pulled him off the air aircraft again, put him back on the, on the floor, I scratched him my kit bag again, I got a second uh, vial of um, Valium and uh, much like the first vial, vial I, I, I was really struggling like I had Parkinson's, I opened it, stuck the needle in it, stuck the, and uh, in, 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 anyway, I say, I, I injected it into the trip and Baz lay back and he went quiet, and we waited a few minutes, and Baz was really quiet. So myself and the tech picked him up this time and actually put him into the back of the chopper, uh, into the back of the aircraft, and we closed the door. And as we closed the door, the, the top, the chopper tech just said to me, "Is he, is he okay?" So I said, "Why?" So he said, "He's gone very, very quiet." And I got another. I went back into a flap again. I thought uh, I'll probably give not Baz an overdose of Baz, and I've, and I've killed him. Anyway, the long short of it, Baz was fine. So that was it. Uh, so we had Baz in the back of the aircraft. Um, the police air wing pilot uh, sorted his, his plane. We taxied up to the top end of the runway, turn, turned around, and by now it was getting really, really dark at night. And we bumped along and we eventually got airborne. And we cleared the, you know, we, we got airborne and we started flying towards Salisbury. And he had uh, like a cubby hole in his aircraft. And I remember he took two cokes out and that was warm as hell. And he opened the one Coke for me and he handed me a Coke and he took a Coke. And I tell you what, that was, that was probably the best Coke I'd ever tasted all my life that I'd been in Malaysia. It was really, really nice. So we flew back to Solby and something I was quite amazed with, as we got to Solby, it was now very, very dark. 
Uh, in the distance, I, I was surprised, quite surprised, how big uh, Salisbury was because the lights just seemed to go on forever. So we, we eventually got to Salisbury Airport. We flew past Salisbury Airport. We made a left-hand turn. And then the pilot got um, hold of the tower and asked if we could land. And we landed. We sort of taxied halfway down the runway, turned to the right, and we taxied down to Chabrit Air Base. And um, there was a chopper. There was an alleyway waiting for us. With the, the, the engine was already going. The blades were already running. And myself and the uh, tech um, took bears out of the – myself and the pilot – uh, the, police, the police pilot took bears off of the aircraft and we carried them across to the chopper tech, to, across to the chopper to the Alouette. We put them in the back of the Alouette. We took off and we flew straight to Andrew Fleming Hospital. And Baz's mom and dad, um, when we landed at the hospital, we were no more than 80 meters from the entrance. And there was an ambulance waiting for us and there was a nurse and two assistants waiting for us as well. And the nurse was quite insistent that we had to put Baz into the back of the ambulance and the ambulance had to take him to the front entrance of the hospital. And it would have been quicker for myself and the chopper tech just to take Baz out, walk to the front entrance, it would have been much quicker. But anyway, the nurse was insistent that Baz had to go in the ambulance. So we put Baz in the ambulance, drove to the entrance of the hospital, myself and the tech took him out again and carried him into a sideboard. Uh, we were ushered into a sideboard and we had been there a couple of minutes and Baz's mom and dad obviously followed us in. And we'd been in there for a couple of minutes, and Dr. Actoloni, who was one of the top neurosurgeons in Rhodesia at the time, uh, he came through and uh, he had a look at our Baz, and, and he saw Baz's mom and dad sitting in the waiting room waiting for us. And uh, he just said to Baz's mom and dad, if they wouldn't mind just leaving the, um, the office out of the room and uh, sit outside, and as soon as he's, he had a look at Baz, he'd come through and have a word with him. And I can remember, as he started taking battles, uh, bandages off, I walked around the back of him, and I stood behind Dr. Actoloni. And I wanted to have a look at Albez's wound to see what it looked like. And once all the bandages were off, Bez's head all matted around the actual wound itself. So there was, there was nothing I could actually see. So, yeah, so that was my um, experience with Albez, uh, Bez's Kazavak. He was obviously hit in the head. and um... yeah, he'd, he'd been hit in the head, he'd been hit in the head, and the round had come out the side of his head. It hadn't gone so it right, straight through. It had come out from the side, yeah. And he was an RLI fellow. Was that an RLI yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and that was just across the border from Matari where... No, 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 he, it was actually in the Hundi Valley. Um, oh, the Hundi Valley. Yeah. Hundi Valley, and they were doing a patrol in on one of the mountains somewhere in that valley, and they had the right. contact there, and Bez was shot in the head there. And um, so the first leg of the Kazvek, I have no yeah. idea what happened. So I just basically picked Bez up for the second leg of the Kazvek, and, and probably had the more interesting uh, Kazvek to do without Bez getting up and wanting to get off the stretcher. And, well, it's uh, amazing <laughs> that you that you had, had the bottle and the fortitude to look after the guys, so that was brilliant. And I tell us your story. Uh, before we end, of, about you actually ending up at the same hospital in the ward next door or something. Yeah, okay, so so what happened is um, that night, well, that night Dr. Actoloni said to me, asked me, uh, where are you going to be sleeping tonight? And up until then, I had not given it a thought, and I said, I haven't got a clue. I said, I'll probably walk back to KG6 and um, go and see if I can uh, do spend the night there. So he called one of the sisters from uh, the casualties ward and told the nurse to go and find um, be a private ward uh, to sleep in for a night. And all she went, she found a private ward. He also told her uh, she must organize me a dinner and breakfast for the following morning, which also happened. So I got a nice dinner that night. I had a nice hot bath, got changed into my new kit, had a nice sleep that night. And, and the following morning, I went down to the admissions and I asked where Bez was, and they said he was in B5. So I went up to the fourth floor. And as the lift doors opened, I didn't have to ask which ward he was in or where he was. I could hear Bez shouting. So I can remember I walked into the ward and there was a, there was a matron standing, so there was a matron at the ward. And her name was Maureen Jamison. And I still remember, oddly enough, I still remember her. And I said to her, and I was a medic at Ward Bez and last night, I'm on my way back to Antoli, please, can I come and say goodbye to Bez? So she said, okay, you can just spend a couple of minutes with him. So I went across to Bez. He, he was lying in the bed. His, both his hands had been tied down, obviously, and he was on a drip. And I said to Bez, hi, Bez. Uh, my name is Daryl. I was a medic that brought you in last night, and I'm on my way back to Amtali. 
and um, my camp is due to end in three or four days time but i will definitely come back and see you in a few days time uh, and with that uh, i left the ward went downstairs uh, i went out to the car park and i asked the taxi driver how far was it to the Antoli um, main road and he said it was about a half an hour 30 minute walk uh, and so I said I had no money on me. Um, I basically bought a Kazakh, a Kazakh in that night. Um, but anyway, so the long short of it, he said, okay, he would take me, he would give me a ride for free to the Amtali main road. So I hitchhiked back to Amtali. And the following day, or the day after that, um, a unit arrived in Amtali, well, we arrived that far, and then we, sure, I'm with we naturally thought th these guys were coming to relieve us. Uh, which wasn't the case, and um, there were a unit that had arrived at Fagendep, and what they were doing is that evening they were going out in patrols. They were doing going to do a mobile patrol in the Bruma Valley, and um, so I was between being a medic. I was nominated as a vehicle escort, and one of the fellow Wellington chaps, Corey Lowe, he the two of us were nominated as vehicle escorts, and I can remember going to uh, Lieutenant uh, Oswald Terry, and I was really miffed about uh, being nominated as, as an escort because I, I did not know who had nominated me. You know, so he said to me, oh, no, it's, it's your last day. If you've got one or two days left, you can just go out and do it and enjoy it. So that's what I did. Uh, so I, I went out, to, I, I traveled on the vehicle. I was on a 2-5 and there were four, four vehicles in the uh, convoy. There were two two fives ahead of us. I was on the 2-5 and there was a 2 five vehicle, be, uh, there was a 4 five behind us. And it was a mobile deployment. As we got into the Bruma Valley, uh, we were traveling very slow. And obviously, each stick would jump off while the vehicles were traveling. And then once the sticks had all deployed, we, we must have traveled for about another two k's down the road. And then we turned around and we started making our way back to the main road in Antali. And going there, I was the third vehicle in the convoy. And, but going back, obviously, I was the second vehicle in the convoy. And I can remember sitting in the back of the 2-5, looking out into the bush. And we were traveling along, and all of a sudden, for a split second, literally a split second, the bush around me lit up in a bright, bright white light, which turned a reddish orange flash. And I didn't even hear the bang. All I, re I remember was feeling the vehicles sort of lifting up in the air, and it's kind of, kind of, kind of, and it sounded like hundreds and thousands of stones hitting underneath the chassis of the um, the two fire uh, two fire was on. But I genuinely didn't hear the bang. I genuinely truth in heard no bang at all. All I heard was these stones hitting the bed, underneath the bed. Well, what sounded like stones? And and I was airborne and I can remember looking down and I was traveling down towards the back tailgate and I thought, I try, and I tried to crawl up into a little ball, trying to miss the back of the tailgate so I could drop onto the road behind me, which never happened. So the smaller my back hit the back of the tailgate and then I dropped onto the road behind uh, the 2.5. And I was convinced that I was paralyzed, but I had no feeling, literally, from my hips downwards. And I was given uh, morphine that night. How I got back to who? How I got back to Antoya, I have no idea. But what I recall is waking up a day or two later, and I was already in Andrew Fleming. How I got from Antoya to Andrew Fleming, I genuinely, truth to say, have no clue whatsoever. So yeah, so I was in Andrew, I was in ward before of the Andrew Fleming and uh, Baz was in Ward B5. So we were in the same floor, same ward, just we were separated by Ward. So I became <laughs> one of Baz's regular visitors. Oh, excellent. <laughs> what an, 17 days, yeah. What an amazing uh, uh, sort of God incidence, coincidence that you ended up. Yeah. And did uh, Baz make a full recovery? He did make a full recovery, yeah. Um, yeah. He went to Sanger Lodge for a couple of months, a few oh. months later. And then he became a, a pastor of a church uh, in Bulawayo. And now he's a pastor of a really large church in Durban, in mm. South Africa. And he travels the world now telling his story. That's and incredible. the last thing about it, each, each year on the 1st of February, mm. uh, I, I, I either send Baz a text or I, I email him. And we, we just uh, recall the day. And so on the 1st of February, in three days' time, I'll be texting Baz again and just saying, how do you remember the day? So yeah, that was that was my experience with our Baz. Well, Daryl, it's it's been a really interesting talk. It sort of yeah, uh, strikes me as um, a, sort of a, a goma pile coming out to be a shining night at the end. And uh, yeah, I, sure, I think sure. that's, that's amazing. And uh, yeah. it's been really great talking to you. Uh, yeah, thank you very you. much for your contribution. It's just... Um, 
another thread in the tapestry of our history. And yeah. uh, if we ever get together one day, it'll be nice to have a beer or two with you. It would be, yeah. Yeah, I it, forget it, where I you live. Is are you living in South Africa? I forget. No, no, I, um, I live in Oakwood, in London. Oh, of course, yeah. I live in Salisbury. The reason I asked no, is I see your your curtain blowing behind you, and I certainly wouldn't open my window. It's, <laughs> it's freezing. Yeah, 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 yeah it was freezing here as well. Yeah. And the funny thing, I was just thinking before we came on, it it it, it was actually quite a strange incident, coincidence. This one of my office, one of my office speaking speaking to one of his two people, one of his. Uh, more than two members as well. And I thought that if you nodded off and went to sleep, it would have been a case of, yeah, you have recently done this. <laughs> so yeah, it, was, it was nice to speak to you again, Tony, one of my officers from Water Yeah, uh, yeah, I think we were together at Vic Falls, weren't yeah, we? Falls, yeah. yeah. And uh, interesting times. It was fantastic. Yeah, it was very, very and, good, yeah. Anyway, Daryl, thank you so much again. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, all the very best to you and look forward That's to meeting well. you one day. Okay.